Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to look at the investigation of spirit mediumship in Brazil. Brazil is probably the foremost country in the world where mediumship practices exist and have taken root. My guest is Dr. Alexander Moreira Almeida, a psychiatrist, a professor of psychiatry. He is editor of several anthologies, including Exploring the Frontiers of Mind-Brain Relationships and Spirituality and Mental Health Across Cultures. Alexander is based in Brazil. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Alexander. What a pleasure it is to be with you today. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a great pleasure being here. Congratulations for the work you have here at the New Thinking Aloud. You've been exploring mediumship and spiritism in, in Brazil for many years from the perspective of a professional in the field of psychiatry. There are so many different ways to look at it, but I know as a psychiatrist, one of the major concerns expressed in the literature has been that people who show mediumistic characteristics are experiencing some form of mental Mental illness. Yes, exactly. Uh, especially in the mid 19th century, in Europe, United States, and even in Brazil, uh, there was a general understanding, usually among psychologists and psychiatrists, that um, mediumistic experience and other trans experience would be a cause or a symptom of mental disorders. So, we have done studies not only in historical studies from that period, but more recently we are interested in performing psychiatric examinations of mediums and try to see the similarities and differences between mediumistic experience and, for example, psychotic or dissociative disorders. And as I understand it from your research, you've come up with a number of examples of individuals who experience symptoms that might otherwise be labeled as psychotic, but they've lived healthy, productive, normal lives uh, for decades. As I recall, one of your subjects was in his 90s and had been experiencing these symptoms his entire life without showing any real sign of pathology. Exactly. That's the point. Uh, because most studies, until a few decades ago, most studies about psychotic symptoms, like, for example, hallucination, seeing things, hearing things, uh, most of studies were performed basically with in psychiatric inpatients. The problem is that usually uh, the researchers extrapolated this data from psychiatric inpatients to the general population. But nowadays, uh, there has been more and more studies on a general population investigate the prevalence of psychotic experience uh, in the general population. And it has been shown that, uh, for example, about 15% of the people worldwide we have reported at least one of this psychotic experience in the last year. So many studies have been investigating this, and we published recently some papers with in-depth case studies. The one that you are reporting is about Divaldo Pereira Franco. He is the most famous living medium in Brazil. He is now nowadays 93 years old. He started having, uh, he started having mediumistic experience, like seeing uh, dead people, like uh, have some precognitive experience and things like that, uh, when he was four years old. In the beginning, he struggled a lot with that. His family did not accept well the experience. Uh, 
Um, he was afraid to being crazy or possessed by devil. And after some time, especially around his um, when, when he was a late teenager, he had contact, for example, with the Spiritism in Brazil. So he was uh, received by a Spiritist center, and then he he reframed his experience as middle mystic experience. And since then, he has led a very productive life. Uh, for example, he has uh, written through mediumistic writing more than 200 books. Uh, he has worked regularly as a public servant and he delivers lectures all over the, the world uh, with no sign of psychotic disorder and things like that. The, the, the major point, I, I think one of the major point uh, nowadays in even psychiatry, uh, conventional psychiatry nowadays, it has been recognized that uh, what we call the positive symptoms of psychosis, that means uh, sense of perception alterations like uh, seeing or hearing things, for example, is not a good marker of pathology, of mental disorder. For example, in a psychosis, most, m much more indicative of psychotic disorder is, for example, cognitive disorganization, uh, in impairment, in, in the functioning uh, or a blunted affect and other symptoms like that. Are you suggesting that this particular individual didn't show those symptoms? Exactly, exactly. He, he, uh, because we usually say that in psychosis we have basically three clusters of symptoms. One is more of unusual experience or positive psychotic symptoms, that means usually uh, perceptual changes, uh, um, seeing things, hearing things, for example, out-of-body experiences, things like that, uh, telepathy, and things like that. This is one sort of experience. The, se the second sort of experience we call negative symptoms, that are, for example, people who uh, have uh, Dif difficulties in relationship, in expression, expressing their feelings, people who have uh, uh, less initiative to, to doing things, and also we have the cognitive disorganization symptoms, people who have troubles in reasoning, in, uh, in pay attention to things, and then uh, be organized in their lives. So basically, uh, what these non-pathological experiences have, these spiritual non-pathological experiences, they have more the, these unusual experiences, this sensorial experience and things like that. They all, but they don't have the other, the disorganization, the cognitive disorganization symptoms, the negative symptoms, the, the loss, the loss of motivation and things like that. And specifically, for example, this case, um, Givaldo Franco, he had a lot of unusual experiences, but he didn't have uh, these other, the other, these other types of uh, pathological symptoms. You mentioned, though, that uh, in his youth he thought he might be persecuted by devils, and you would not consider that necessarily a symptom of cognitive disorganization. No, uh, one point because first, it's if it fits uh, the cultural background of the the, the person. Uh, we had, uh, before this study, we had investigated 115 active mediums in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Uh, what we found is that most of them, uh, they did not grow up, they did not grow up in a spiritist family. They usually grew up in a Catholic family or even a Protestant family. But they start having their experience usually in childhood or adolescence. So their experience was not uh, well accepted by the social environment. And these were the two most worries that they had, that they were losing their minds, they were became crazy, or that they were under demonic influence. That's, th this is another very important aspect, because usually these non-pathological experiences they do not cause suffering or impairment. By the experience by itself, 
However, the impairment of suffering can come for the lack of social support or the cognitive framework that frames this experience in a very negative way. For example, is a mental disorder or is a diabolic uh, influence or things like that. You used the word reframing earlier, and I think that's very important. That it seems as if for people who are having, let's call them paranormal experiences of a subjective nature, and in the context of traditional religions, that could be viewed as mental illness or diabolic possession. But in the context of spiritism, especially the various spiritistic sects in Brazil, and I know there are many, uh, it can be viewed in an entirely different light. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's the point. It has been... Um uh, there has been a growing recognition that the, the cognitive framework for this non-pathological experience, paranormal, spiritual, or anomalous experience as a whole, is essential, is very important to, to determine uh, if it will have a positive or negative influence in, on these people. But it's very important also to keep in mind that I'm not denying at all the existence of psychotic disorders, the existence of schizophrenia or other disorders. Because also we have also, at the same time, we have uh, several people having non-pathological anomalous experience labeled as people having mental disorders, we also can have the other way around. People having truly psychotic disorders that need, that are in need of, for example, antipsychotic medication, and they deny they, they, the patients themselves, but also relatives, uh, even the religious leaders, they deny that it is a mental disorder, and they, they claim that's just a spiritual experience or, or things like that. So in, because of that, there is a huge delay in starting treatments with severe impact in the prognosis of these patients. I'm under the impression that maybe more than any other country, Brazil has a culture that favors the practice of, of mediumship in many different contexts. Would you say that's true? I can say that in Brazil, mediumship is something uh, usually well accepted in the country, despite, for example, most of Brazilians are Catholics, and also we have a large number of Protestants, but the third largest religion group is Spiritism, and the fourth largest religion group are African Brazilian religions. These last two have a strong emphasis on mediumistic experience. But even, for example, especially among Catholics in Brazil, they, many of them are very open to mediumistic experiences. It's quite frequent in Brazil, for example, a person being a Catholic, but at the same time attending spiritual centers, centers to, uh, to watch lectures, to receive some treatments, to reading spiritist books and things like that. Just to give an example, there is a national survey in Brazil showing that half of Catholics in Brazil believe in reincarnation. So this is a very widespread belief in Brazil, for example. Now, spiritism in, in Brazil is really goes back to Allan Kardec in France, that's his pen name, and you have written a fascinating paper. Many people today think of Kardec as the founder of a religion, but you point out that he approached this phenomenon as an academic expert in pedagogy or the, the study of the science of education, and uh, that his approach was largely quite skeptical, at least initially. Yes, exactly. Alain Kardec uh, was a French scholar from the mid 19th century. He was a member of several scientific societies in, in France at that period. And uh, he was much in favor of free thinking and things like that. And uh, he started investigating mediumistic experience because there was a, a, a huge interest in Western Europe and United States in the mid 
19th century middle mystic experience, the modern spiritualism. And so he started to investigate this. He took, at first, a more skeptical approach. He thought it could be uh, some physical force or unconscious activity or fraud. But later, after uh, his studies, he became convinced that, of course, it could be fraud, it could be uh, unconscious mind activity, it could be telepathy, but also, in many cases, they were caused by uh, deceased spirits through mediumship. So, uh, Kardec uh, himself did not... Uh, Kardec created the word spiritism. He created the word when he published the book the, the Book of Spirits, in, published in 1857. And in this book, he created the word spiritism, spiritist, and things like that. Uh, and he did not... He claimed that spiritism was not a religion, but it was a spiritualist philosophy that was developed based on his uh, scientific investigations. But he also stressed that this philosophy had strong ethical or perhaps spiritual implications, but not being an organized religion with dogmas and things like that. I understand that his methodology was one we might call today one of consensus, that he would interview different mediums in trance. And when seven different mediums, I think that's the number he selected, uh, were all in agreement on some particular point, he would consider that a form of authentication. He compared mediums with microscopes or telescopes. Uh, they would be kind of instruments that would allow us to see the unseen. Uh, so that would be the idea. And uh, yes, he uh, tried to use as many mediums he could. Actually, he developed an impressive network of, uh, in more than 40 different countries around the globe. Uh, connected with hundreds of people in different continents, uh, having contact with mediums and different and things like that. So he, he developed a huge uh, network, and he had made contacts with these uh, researchers and people working with mediums in different countries. And also, he himself uh, investigated many different mediums in France, in Switzerland, for example. And yes, he he. Uh, he tried as much as he could uh, to have similar questions or to investigate the, some phenomena in different mediums to see if uh, there are similarities. For example, uh, in what this alleged deceased spirits would claim, uh, how they are behaving, uh, what were the consequences of or their uh, actions in the previous life and things. So based on this investigation and putting together and uh, checking different uh, information from different mediums, he developed uh, spiritism. Now, in your work, I think one of the most important questions that you've looked at is whether or not mediums in trance are able to access forms of information through paranormal means that turn out to be valid. Yes, exactly. So the first, our first uh, research line, uh, our first way to investigate mediums first was to check uh, the mental health of these mediums. So is this just a mental disorder? Is just a symptom of mental disorder or not? So after years of investigation, different ways, it was clear that uh, mediums usually were. Uh, are, were are uh, mentally sane, men mentally healthy, and okay, if they are not um, psychotic, what are these experiences? Th this is uh, 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 the major next question. And based on that, we have performed investigation, for example, in neuroimaging studies, try to investigate how the brain works, and also another way to investigate what are the ultimate nature of this experience, we um, try to investigate if mediums can produce information about a deceased person, for example, information that they could not possibly have by natural means. For example, 
through uh, the contact with the, the the relative of the deceased person or in the press or whatever. So yeah, so you have developed different strategies of uh, to perform this research, to investigate if mediums can actually have access to what we call anomalous information reception. Anomalous information reception. That's a, a, a lovely term. And I know in particular, you focused on one of the most famous mediums of the 20th century, Chico Xavier. Yes, exactly. Uh, our first study in this topic about the anomalous information reception among mediums was with Chico Xavier. Chico Xavier was the most prolific medium in Brazil. He died in 2002. Uh, he also uh, wrote more than 400 books through mediumistic writing, what they called psychography. Is a kind of automatic writing. He donated all copyrights to, to charity. He never received any money, payment, or donation to himself uh, because of his mediumistic work. He retired era as a low-level public servant, and all his life he lived a very humble life. He died, I, I think it's about in, in almost 90 years old, uh, having a very humble life. And one of the most interesting aspects of his mediumship, the first part of his mediumship was strongly devoted to writing books, but uh, the last decades of his life he devoted more to writing letters, writing letters to those who lost their loved ones. So these letters were allegedly written by the deceased. Uh, for example, a, 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 a young man who died in a car, car crash, for example, uh, wrote a letter to, their, to his parents. So we investigate some of these letters. The limitation of the study is it was a retrospective study. So we were not there present when the letters were written. But we were able to get the letters, we were able to interview the relatives and other people that were related to that to investigate what kind of information was passed to Chico Xavier and what kind of information uh, were in the letters and what were the possibilities of Chico Xavier having access to, this, uh, to these pieces of information. And what we found in the studies that we published, we published some papers on this topic, was that these letters uh, had a high level of precise information, and most of them uh, uh, we could not trace a way in which Chico Xavier could have access to this information. And several, several very specific informations, for example, about uh, uh, the childhood of the deceased person, about uh, uh, very private matters in the family. For example, only the father knew that experience that he himself had. No one else in the family knew about that. And these informations were in the letters. I understand that uh, when you say highly accurate, we're talking about well over 90% accuracy. Yes, exactly, exactly. So uh, many uh, specific information, as, as I said, uh, um, about the, the, the way of dying, the way of living, the, uh, the names of relatives, deceased and living relatives, names of places. So really uh, very, very uh, specific information. And most of them that have not been, to our knowledge, passed uh, to the medium. Yeah. This is not just a single letter. This is a level of accuracy that you and your colleagues observed over numerous uh, letters of this sort developed through the mediumship of Chico Xavier. Chico Xavier wrote probably thousands of these letters, okay, but we published uh, the studies of two sets of letters to relate to two uh, different deceased people, okay? Uh, one, uh, in one paper, we analyzed only one letter, and the other paper, we analyzed 13 letters related to that uh, 
to another specific disease person. Uh, definitely, it would be very important if we could have more uh, studies on this topic. But because of this limitation, because it's a retrospective study, we cannot have know for sure uh, what kind of information was passed to the medium, we start to develop um, new prospective studies. So we have uh, developed and published some new studies with uh, living mediums, and that uh, studies we were able to control actually what kind of information was passed to the mediums. And did the same level of accuracy show up in the prospective studies? So uh, the first study, we uh, basically replicated some the triple blind uh, design of mediumistic studies that were developed in the United States and the UK. Uh, this so, because the point is, uh, in Brazil, what usually happens? Uh, usually, uh, the medium uh, it's a, he is in a spiritist center or some place like that, and usually there is a meeting, for example, once a week, once a month, or things like that, where. Uh, people who lost their loved ones recently, they go there and try to, to have contact or receive a letter. That's the point. Usually, we have dozens or hundreds of people in the same meeting asking for this sort of information. And, and usually, also, they have a small contact with the, the medium, usually a, a very brief interview, a few seconds or a few minutes, uh, the mediums claim that it's useful to make connection to see if they will be able to be in contact with the deceased. So, in the first study that we developed uh, this triple blind the protocol, uh, the most experienced mediums in writing this kind of letters, they did not accept to take part in the study because they said that it was too different, too artificial for them uh, to perform this sort of study where they could have no contact at all with the, the sitters, with the relatives, and uh, um, any other sorts of controls that they thought it was uh, very unnatural to them. So did, they did not accept, but we were able to recruit other mediums, uh, all the experienced mediums, but not that experienced in writing uh, this sort of letters. So in this first study, we had a negative result. So we, uh, uh, we were not able to show that mediums produced uh, information above chance, uh, for, because in the end, the sitters, they received their letters, the letter intended to them, and four, five different, five others control letters, but they did not know which letter was for, for, for them. And they had to choose uh, one of the letters. So they were not able to choose the right one above chance. So this was, um, we were not able to show any sort of anomalous information reception in this study. So in trying to, so, but we, it raised among us the question about what we call ecological validity. If the, the method was appropriate to that public, to that uh, subject of study, the mediums. So we developed a different uh, protocol. We interviewed very experienced mediums in producing uh, this kind of letters and tried to figure out what would be the environment that they would feel comfortable in working in. And at the same time, we tried to include all sorts of control to avoid that uh, to control for any kind of information that would be passed f uh, from the relatives to the medium. So this is exactly the kind of study that we perform. So in this sense, what happened? We selected the, the, the sitters, the ones who were grieving uh, for a loved one in the last two years. We select the, 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 these people and we select the mediums. But they did not know each other previously. The mediums were from far from our city because we developed this research here in Juiz de Fora, Minas Gerais State in Brazil. So the relatives were from this region, but the mediums were at least uh, 400 miles away from here. So they, so this, the, the, 
sitters and the mediums they had never had previous contact. So the only contact they had, we were video recording everything. So we were able to see every word, everything that the relative could have told or exhibited to, to the medium. Usually they had very short contact, usually few seconds or at least two, at the most two minutes, very brief conversation. And then after that, the medium wrote uh, the letters. So we had all the, based on that, we, were, we are now investigating if the letters uh, contain information that could not be inferred from the information that they got uh, in, in the seance. We, we just published a first paper now describing the protocol as a whole. We found uh, in, in, this, uh, in this study, we uh, involved uh, three mediums, 142 sitters, and we had 26 letters. Uh, the mediums and the sitters felt very comfortable with the protocol. Uh, it was also interesting that the, the, the level of belief in paranormal experience, the level of spirituality did not predict who would receive the letter. Because as I said, we had one for 142 sitters, but only 21 of them received the letters. So we try to see what would be the predictor of receiving a letter. And uh, the only predictor was the severity of grief. Uh, the severity of grief predicted the, the, the likelihood to receive the letter. In the end of the study, 96% uh, of uh, sitters considered the letters to be definitely or probably for the deceased relative. But we are now analyzing uh, in detail each letter to investigate uh, if they have or not um, anomalous information that could not be explained in regular ways. And we hope that very soon we'll be published some of these papers. Well, I wonder if mediumship isn't in some ways parallel to remote viewing, which is a popular practice here in the United States, where you have some star performers who can routinely come up with accuracy close to 100%, and then you have hundreds of other people entering the field uh, whose accuracy is sometimes very good, but oftentimes uh, they experience what they call displacement, or they're simply not accurate for reasons that we don't yet understand. I actually, I think it's any sort of this paranormal experience or spiritual experience are similar to any other human skill. For example, in Brazil, we love soccer, uh, and we can have a, a big soccer star in a certain game. He performs. Explained it. The next game, <laughs> he performs awfully. So the same person with the same team uh, performs very different because there are so many variables that can influence the performance. But actually, it happens in any skills. For example, I'm also a, a professor at the university. Perhaps sometimes I give, I deliver the same lecture. One day, I think, oh, it was explained. The other day, I, mm, that lecture was not very good. But it's the same. I am the same person delivering the same content, but the environment, my state of spirit, everything changed. So I think it's exactly the same with any other uh, human skill. If it's not like that, it perhaps even can raise suspicions about the, that skill specifically. So definitely, I agree with you. I think uh, uh, there are some mediums that can perform more consistently in much higher level, but even those uh, also had their, their bad days. Leonor Piper, one of the most famous mediums, uh, most studied mediums, a Bostonian woman from 19th century, was exa an example. In the good days, she produced very, very a high level of very precise information, a large amount of them. In the other days, she produced uh, usually inaccurate information and things like that. So I think mediums is something like that.
The point is how can we stimulate and create an environment to allow mediums perform in a better way, but at the same time that we could control and analyze in a proper way to avoid fraud and other conventional explanations. I would imagine that your position as a professor of psychiatry put, puts you in a sort of unique perspective looking at this, especially since in some sense, the spiritist community is in competition with the psychiatric community in that many uh, social services and mental health cases are, are handled uh, through the spiritist centers. Actually, I don't think there is a competition. More and more, we think that there is a complementary approach, né? Uh, specifically in the academic environment. Uh, we work in spirituality as a whole. Né? I, I was, until last year, the chair of the section on spirituality of, uh, and psychiatry of the World Psychiatric Association. And the point, of course, is not to impose any religious or spiritual beliefs, and not to replace psychological or psychiatric treatment to, to patients. Uh, um, but the point is to de develop a real biopsychosocial spiritual approach of people, taking in consideration the biological aspects, psychological, social, and spiritual aspects. And uh, definitely, I think we need to move on, to, to go beyond this idea of competition that unfortunately was very prevalent in last century and even uh, in the current century. Religious groups in opposition to medical groups or medical groups in opposition to, to psychological, to psychology and psychology with psychiatry and uh, religion. Of course, we, we don't need this. <laughs> we, we, to value spirituality, we don't need to deny the biology or the psychology or whatever. I think that is the, the major point. But Coming back to your question about the spiritism and providing support, yes, in Brazil we have also a very specific and interesting experience that are the spiritist psychiatric hospitals. Dozens of these hospitals were founded in Brazil in the last century. Uh, usually they had, and, and these spiritist psychiatric hospitals were not only spiritists, they had psychiatrists, they still have, that. They, they are still working. Uh, they had psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, uh, nurses, and also spiritual support uh, uh, to this uh, to, to the patients. So, in the same, in the, also for example, in spiritist centers is very common people seeking help in the spiritist centers for spiritual healings, you know, other practices like that. And even, for example, the spirit centers, usually they recommend people to go to their doctors, to the psychologists, and so on, but also to seek the spiritual support. So I think that, uh, we can learn more and more and how to work in a collaborative work because our goal must be the well-being of the population. So, in other words, it would seem as if in Brazil there's more cooperation between the medical community, and particularly the psychiatric community, and the spiritist community than one would find in other countries. And in the United States, I think such cooperation is pretty much negligible. Yes, but it's not at so easy. Uh, many psychiatrists, for example, and psychologists are very suspicious about anything about religion, about spirituality. So that, because we, we, uh, the, the psychiatry and psychology in Brazil had a strong influence for, for European and North American schools. For example, psychoanalysis from Freud. Freud had a strong influence in Brazil and still has, especially nowadays in psychology, and usually have very negative views of spirituality, of religion. So sometimes they are very suspicious about that. But, uh, but many other, many other pro uh, professionals are quite open to this. Actually, there are some studies, some current studies about the spirituality of psychologists and psychiatrists in Brazil showing that by large, most of them are are spiritual or religious persons and they have they are open to take in consideration the spirituality 
uh, of patients. And in Brazil also we have, it's, it's a non-academic uh, organization, but there is, for example, the, the Medical Spiritist Association that congregates people who are spiritists and physicians, for example, to discuss the implications between spiritism and, uh, and, and health. Brazil is also unique in the sense that some of the great mediums like Chico Xavier have been publicly honored by the country as a whole. For example, I, I believe many years ago, Chico Xavier himself appeared on Brazilian postage stamps. Yes, yes. Uh, for example, Chico Xavier, specifically because of his char charitable enterprise, he has always been so humble and helping people and also developing social uh, assistance to, to many uh, uh, people in need. Uh, he received a lot of respect in Brazil and even uh, uh, I think, I think it was about 20 years ago, there was a survey in Brazil, uh, 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 people would vote uh, for what would be the Brazilian of the century. He was among of the most voted uh, for the Brazilian of the century. A and um, yes, for example, we had also some movies, very good movies, one very good movie about Chico Xavier and another about the life of Givaldo Franco. These two movies were very popular. His books, for example, Chico Xavier books, they sell millions of copies until now, dozens of million copies uh, until now. So definitely it's very popular, it's very respected, usually because of, this, uh, of their examples of life. You mentioned that he lived a humble life. He worked as a low-level public servant throughout his life, even while he was writing hundreds of books through some form of spiritual dictation called psychography. And, and I'm under the impression that he actually, by donating the royalties from all of these books to charity, we're, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars he donated to help poor people. No, yeah, exactly. Because in the spiritism, when I as Allan Kardec uh, uh, developed, uh, Allan Kardec emphasized pretty much that uh, uh, mediums should not be paid by mediumship. They, they believe that medium, mediumship is a gift from God that people receive for free and should give for free. Uh, and then uh, there is, since Allan Kardec, uh, there is in Spiritism a strong emphasis in mediumship as a charitable uh, practice and that people should not, should never, ever uh, receive any personal benefits for this. So because of this, in all spiritist centers in Brazil, the mediumship is always for free. You never have to pay anything. So Chico Xavier and Divaldo Franco are two examples of that. Have you done any studies comparing the Afro-Brazilian styles of mediumship with the spiritist approach? We, we published a few years ago, I study with uh, Umba. Umbanda is the most common African-Brazilian religion. Uh, a Umbanda priest we call Manji Santo. Uh, also, it was an in-depth study of uh, uh, a prominent... Uh, Umbanda priest in Brazil, like we did with Givaldo Franco. It, 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 the story is very similar. She started in uh, childhood having uh, precognitive dreams. He started uh, having a spontaneous trans possession. And he was also uh, not well accepted by uh, her relatives, her parents, uh, and so she struggled with that. She tried to, to suppress this experience, she tried to, to avoid and not tell anyone about this, so it, it caused a lot of struggles. But after some time, uh, it was, I don't remember exactly, but about in, in her mid-twenties, she went to a African-Brazilian center, a Umbanda center, and there uh, she started to understand in a new light, uh, she reframed uh, 
uh, her experience and received support and then she became uh, in the next years a, a prominent uh, Umbanda leader, Umbanda uh, priest in, in Brazil. So uh, this is the only study that actually that we have performed with African Brazilian religions, but definitely it will be important to have more studies on this topic also. Well, Alexander, it's been a real pleasure exploring this fascinating world that you live in. You're, you're in, from our perspective here in North America, a very exotic country, and yet you're uh, approaching it with all the tools of modern Western science and all of the cultural resources there in Brazil. So uh, you're in a very unique position. I'm looking forward to future interviews with you exploring the details of your research even further. Alexander, thank you so much for being with me today. Jeff, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, to talk to your audience, to discuss about this. I, I always call this human experiences. We need to, to know, uh, to understand the human experience as a whole. What are we as human beings? And this experience that we have here in Brazil, actually, it's not here, only here in Brazil. Perhaps here in Brazil, people are more open to this experience, but definitely they, this is a kind of experience that happened in any country, in any place, and throughout history. The, and I think it's very important to, to respect this experience, but at the same time, using the tools of science that we have to try to have a better understanding, a better grasping of this experience. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.